Hello, and welcome to foodplusfreedom.com, where you gain information and skills to further your food freedom. Today, we're going to answer some of the questions you've sent to us. Before we get into it, if you find our content useful, please subscribe, like, and share our videos, podcasts, and articles. Follow us on social media, which is listed in the description below. Plus, subscribe to our website, foodplusfreedom.com, for more videos, podcasts, and articles. Now, let's get answering some of those questions. Hey, this is Janet, foodplusfreedom.com. Today is May 21st, 2024. This is episode 32, May Q&A time. Every month, we take five or six questions or discussions, and we put them out in a Q&A. If you have a question about homesteading, or what we're doing on our homestead, go ahead and email us at support at foodplusfreedom.com. We will answer you, plus if it's a question we hear quite often, you may find it in a Q&A. So let's get started. Question number one, what do you do when you're going forward in homesteading or food freedom and the people in your world are not with you? I get this question quite a bit. You know, one person in the family wants to move forward and the rest don't. Let's break this down. If you're on a food freedom journey and it's your spouse or significant other who does not see what you see, have patience, explain to them what you're doing, have a good conversation and keep moving forward because they will see what you're doing. They will see the importance and hopefully they will join you sooner than later. If it's your children, well, they're your children and you're doing what's right for them according to you. That's why you're the parent. If you're bringing your kids home to educate them, It may come with a little resistance. Who knows, this day and age it may not. But you just have to keep going and find solutions. And don't let those kids bully you. They're really good at that sometimes. If you're taking away food from the family, such as dyes, you know, just explain to them. By being the example, they will see what you are doing. There are a lot of ways to have alternatives to some of the foods, you know, making from scratch, find companies that are making them better than you're having now. And it's a process going from where you are to where you want to be. And it's step by step by step by step by step. Very few people one day go, we're cleaning out our cupboards, we're changing everything, we're moving. Some people do that. If it's extended friends and family, they may not be specifically against that you're homesteading. I'm going to guess that they just don't get it. But you may hear things like, why are you doing that? Why don't you eat that anymore? Is this really necessary? Oh, you'll grow out of it. You know, do you really want to bring the kids home? You'll have no free time. Just remember, they don't understand what you understand. Their mindset has not evolved to where your mindset has. Remember before you wanted to start getting food freedom, where you were and the process you had to go through to decide that this is what you wanted to do. Well, they're not there yet. There are ways to deal with it. For instance, if you have someone who's taking care of your kids or a family member who insists on giving them dyes and you've taken dyes out of your diet and your children's diet, you need to have a frank conversation with them saying, you will not give my children this. And if they don't like it, there could be some rifts. But you need to stand your ground because if you're changing how you're eating and your children are eating and they're being given the same junk, you're not making them healthier. They're just going to bounce back and forth health-wise, and it's not good for them. It may mean bringing snacks wherever you go, bringing food wherever you go, so that they have approved food that is going to help them be healthier than they were when you started this whole thing. It's a journey, and yes, it can be hard, but don't give up. You probably don't understand how they don't see what's going on, and you probably don't understand why they're not on the same bandwagon as you are. Because you're growing and they're not, and human nature says, "Uh uh-oh, someone's growing away from me, this isn't good. You know, you will have people who will support you no matter what. They'll say, it's not for me, but I support you, and those are the ones that are golden. And then you're going to meet other people in your journey who are already doing what you're doing, or who want to do what you're doing, and you grow more support. You're growing, and that's good. So if you feel like you're not being supportive, have some frank conversations and make some good decisions for yourself and your family and keep going. You can do it. Question number two. 
Do you really drink your raw milk? Yes, we milk our cows. We have three that are milkable. Well, we actually have four that are milkable. Three we are milking right now. One is an Ayrshire, which is a fairly large milk cow. And two are Dexters, which are dual purpose cows. The reason we are doing three, because we get a lot of raw milk and we're learning to make a lot of cheese. This year I wanted to learn to make more products with our raw milk, since we have so much. We're also having it go back into the homestead to help feed like the chickens. We don't have pigs. Now everyone says, you gotta get a pig, you got all this milk. Nope, we don't want any pigs. We're happy right where we are. And that milk still goes back into the farm. So yes, we do drink our raw milk. And no, I am not worried about any of the scares that I have seen about different diseases being in my milk or the bacteria or anything else. One, raw milk is not the same food as pasteurized milk. It has all the good bacteria. I know what my animals are eating. They're all grass fed, which means I know they're not getting anything that's genetically modified. And I know that they're having a good life. Plus, we do something called milk share, and that is where we get milk and the calf gets milk. At this point, we're not separating the calves. They eat, usually right before we go out to milk. I have one that feeds while I'm milking, which is hilarious because she's being trained to be a milk cow in two years. Yes, it takes that long. And she's very docile, and I pet her while we're milking because that one we use a machine on. The other one I milk by hand. So yes, we drink our own raw milk. Now, if you're looking to buy raw milk, you need to make sure that it's one of the things that you're allowed to do in your state. There's all sorts of different rules for raw milk, and there's usually a go-around everywhere so you can find raw milk. If you're concerned about things like TB, because that's one of the scares they have put out there, you can have the animal tested for TB. But in all honesty, most of the United States is TB free. You can go to the US government site and look up TB farms, and I believe they still list them. But most of the United States, there's good sections that it's TB free, which means we really don't have it. You know, and I don't know how much proof there is, is if a cow has TB that it actually comes out in pasteurization. I don't know. So if you're looking for raw milk or you're looking for your own cow to milk, you know, ask them, are you drinking the milk? You know, and any tests you want to get done, get it done on your cow and find out if that gives you peace of mind. But number two, yes, we milk our own cows and we drink our own milk. I make cheese and yogurt and kefir and of course ice cream. Number three, we're going to continue on with the beef theme here and it's about grass fed beef and milk. I've read different articles saying, well, if you get grain fed beef, it's only 10% or 20% of their, of their feed. It's not a whole lot. Well, I'm here to tell you, cows were not ever meant to have grain. They were meant to have grasses. They, you know, if there is a cornfield out there and there is grass out there, they don't just go over to the corn and start munching through the stalks. They're gonna eat the grass around it. You know, they're related to the buffalo. Did the buffalo go around eating corn all the time? No, they were moving across our country eating grass and on grasslands. It has been proven scientifically that when a rumen animal, such as a cow, a goat, a sheep, when they're given grain, which is usually corn, um, corn mixes, you know, pea mixes, and they just do these mixes and they're eating grain, they put molasses in it. Um, unfortunately, the commercial industry puts all sorts of other crap in it, like M&Ms and genetically modified stuff. Remember, a lot of grain is based on corn or soy. And the majority of our corn or soy in the United States is genetically modified and sprayed, sprayed, sprayed. The cow's digestive system is meant to break down grass and ferment it so their body can absorb all of the nutrients. I believe 110% that a grass-fed, 100% grass-fed animal, rumen animal, is healthier 
for you and for them. We don't have issues with bloat. They're cheaper to raise. Yes, we have to raise them a little bit longer. However, they are healthier. Look at this very simply. You are what you eat. If it's meat or milk, what that animal ate comes to you. If they're eating grain, that's, you know, some people think, oh, it's got better flavor. Well, it's how you cook it, how you raise it, how it's butchered. When you have a grass-fed animal, you don't have to worry about additives or anything else. Let me give you some personal information from the last 19 years of raising cows. They've always been grass-fed here. They've never gotten grain, not even for treats. If they're getting a treat, they're getting an alfalfa cube, or they're getting some gra grasses or legumes that would be growing out in the field sprouted. Normally, for a grain-fed animal, it takes about 18 months to raise it to full size. For a grass-fed animal, it takes about 28 to 29 months. Yes, it takes longer, and yes, you have to have hay. In order to have hay, you either have to buy the hay or you have to have equipment to do it, so there is a cost. However, there's a larger cost in raising your beef on grain. If you do not get grain that is non-GMO or organic, then you are putting genetically modified food into your cow and then you're eating that. So think about that. The question of grass-fed, 100% grass-fed beef versus grain. If you're buying meat, ask the questions. Is this animal grass-fed? And they'll, if they say, oh, they get a little grain, that means they're grain-fed. You know, a cow is not going to be 100% grain-fed or they'd be sick. They're, they would. They would truly be sick if they're not getting hay or baleage of any sort. So I don't know of any cows that are 100% you know, grain-fed. They may do that in the feedlots, but I don't want any meat out of a feedlot either. So ask the question, do you feed grain or how do you feed your animals? Listen to what they say and how they say it. They're out on pasture when they can be. Are they eating hay? Are they getting any grain? Some places think it's a good idea to grain finish because you get a marbling. You know what, let the animal grow naturally over two years, and we go a little more than two years, 29 months, and let them grow. There's gonna be marbling on them. There might not be as much fat, but the animal will grow how it's supposed to be. Number four, this question came from a discussion about how we can use less seeds in our garden and still grow optimal amount of food. Now, as we start going further and further in our food freedom journey, we, you'll realize that you really need to be in control of your seeds. You need to be able to save seeds. You need to be able to use as few seeds as possible. But how do we do that as we're getting started? Can we do that? And the answer is yes, it's called cloning. What cloning is, it's when you have a plant that is maturing and you can take a cutting from it. Now this does not work on all plants. It does not work on root vegetables. But tomatoes, it works great for. Once you have several areas where they've branched out, you can trim off a branch, stick it in water. I like to use peroxide water because it has more oxygen in it. I like to put a little molasses in there. And it'll start growing roots and then you can plant that plant. Yes, you will have some, when you do that, you'll have some plants that are bigger than others in the same grow, but you have another plant. A couple things about cloning. The clone that you've taken off, that cutting off of the main plant, is the same exact age, which means they may not get as big as the original plant because they are the same age. They may not, if it's a tomato plant, the cutting may not get tomatoes at the exact same time as the other, as the original plant, but it won't be too far behind. Now you have two plants. Now the question is, are you going to get more food off of two plants than you are on one? It depends on how you're trellising them or how your setup is for like tomatoes. Talking about pots, 
Yes, now you have another pot with another tomato plant in it, so you're going to get more tomatoes. If it's an easy way to spread it out, then you have more tomatoes. Maybe you're going to take that tomato and you're going to swap with a friend of yours who has peppers that you don't have. So it does have a purpose. You can do this with peppers, tomatoes, anything that has a stem like peppers or tomatoes. You can do this from your berry plants, you know, your blueberries, your goji berries. A lot of times these plants, when you get them, they're just a stick and you have to start from that. Yes, it takes three or four years to start getting fruit when you do a cloning from a berry plant, but it's very possible. The plants that I have not been able to root this way, and if you have, please drop it in the comments or email me. I have not been able to clone anything that has a hollow stem, like cucumbers or zucchini. I haven't been able to do it. Pumpkins, haven't been able to do it. The good thing with those, it's really easy to get more seeds out of those plants. But if you find any kind of plant that you're growing that does have kind of a woody stem, sure, go ahead and try it. So that is one way to not use as many seeds, but you also have to learn how to save seeds. Number five, when should I start saving seeds? Simple answer, right now. Make sure you sign up at our website, foodplusfreedom.com, because very soon we're going to start a series of videos on how to save seeds where we're going to show you how to save different types of seeds as the fruit is becoming ripe on our homestead and how we save them so that you can learn to save seeds one seed at a time. If you're already getting food or you're going to save seeds from the store, remember there are wet seed saving and dry seed saving. You can look those up. Dry seeds are like peas. Wet seeds are like tomatoes. So. When should you start saving seeds? Right now. And you can, even if you're not growing anything yet, because at the store, hopefully you're buying organic because then it's not genetically modified. You can save the seeds out of whatever you're eating. Eating an eggplant, save the seeds. Eating peas, save the seeds. Eating green beans, look for the biggest ones and save some of the seeds. If you like dry beans, like pinto beans and cranberry beans, and you have a bunch of dry ones, you already have some seeds. Now the thing with the seeds from the store is they're most likely hybrid. Even organic farms use mostly hybrid these days because they're more stable. When people go to the grocery store, they want every tomato to look the same. So what they've done is that they have hybrid them. It is not, I say it is not genetically modified. They have let two different varieties cross and then they cross them back. To stabilize them. If you're saving from your own garden or somebody's giving you some tomatoes or another food and you're saving the seeds, if they're using or you're using heirloom, which means they're old seeds, open pollinated, which means they're going to pollinate whatever is there. So if you have two different types of squash, good chance you're going to create another type of squash because they will cross pollinate. If you want to save true seeds to the mother plants, you need to not plant similar types of vegetables next to each other. A lot of different fruits and vegetables are in the same family. You know, the pumpkin, the squashes, they're all in the same family and they can cross pollinate. So no matter if you're getting things from the store or you're getting food from your own garden or a farmer's market, start saving those seeds. Even if you don't use them, you're learning the skill on how to save them. And most likely, you're not going to get it perfect 100% of the time on saving your seeds, at least not in the beginning. Because what you're doing is you're building your own seed vault. What's really fun to do is if you're saving some seeds and you still have enough growing season, take some of them and try to grow them. See if you can grow your own seeds. That's always fun. So when should you start saving seeds? Right now because you never know what you're going to be able to grow, but you're going to have food. And having your own food is definitely more freedom. And number six, how can I grow more food without going insane? We have to keep that without going insane part very strong in the forefront of this, because we could all just 
grow, 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 and have tons and tons of food and not have any sleep and go, why are we doing this? Food freedom is a balance between your life how you want it and growing however much food you want to. You can do as much as you want or as little as you want. One way to grow more food is to grow vertically so you're growing more food in less space so your time isn't going from bed to bed to bed. Everything is right there. Another way to grow more food is to do something called succession planting. This is really good on short-term vegetables and fruit, like lettuce. Instead of planting an entire two-by-two two box of lettuce, and that may not seem big if you're a big lettuce eater, you plant one by one, but then you plant another one by one, maybe three, four weeks later. That way you're eating your lettuce, and as you're finishing that lettuce, the other lettuce is coming up, depending on how fast that vegetable is growing. Radishes, they grow in 30 days, so if you're planting some every week, you're gonna have some fresh constantly without doing a lot of work at one time because you're just doing a little bit at a time. Another way how I like to grow more food is I grow a little bit every day. Okay, most days. For instance, yesterday I planted some onions and I just, I had onion seeds. Where we live, normally food isn't going out and I'm growing things inside. We've had a very warm spring. So I've been planting a lot of seeds outside just to see what would happen. Now this could be a risk because what happens if it doesn't grow? It'll grow. You just have to be a little more patient because instead of putting a plant that is two feet tall out in your garden and seeing it, you're starting with the seed so you have to watch it grow and you have to remember, okay, this takes 60 days to grow and I started it from seed. It's just a little mental gymnastics you have to do with yourself. But yesterday I planted onions. That's all I planted. I wanted them in several different beds. I made a little area and I sprinkled my seeds in there, I covered them up, I watered them, and for the most part I marked them. That's all I did yesterday. But if I do a little bit every single day, then it's just a little bit. Today I didn't plant anything, but I did cut a bunch of lemon balm so I could freeze dry it, dehydrate it, made a tincture out of it. That plant's basically cut down. We will get another cutting, but I don't have to worry about that anymore. I have enough lemon balm for probably the next six or seven months for my teas, and I have the tincture I, I'm going to need for the rest of the year that we won't even start using until winter when we can't get fresh lemon balm. So it's just one thing that we're going to do. You know, tomorrow, I don't know what I'm going to plant yet or what I'm going to pick because I either plant or pick. Sometimes I do both. But that's how I have found that I do a little bit at a time and it's progressive. You know, your garden doesn't have to look perfect. You know, some people like to be more organized than others. We are not in that organization of it needs to look a certain way. It's just not me. So we all get to choose how we want to do it. And the last way I know how you can grow more food and not feel like you're in the garden all of the time, unless that's where you want to be. Another way to grow a little bit more food is to grow inside year round. As in herbs that become perennial if they're in the right environment year round. Now not all herbs, but most herbs, you can keep them growing year round and then you don't have to worry about planting them because they're done. And the last way to grow more food is grow more perennial food, meaning more blueberry bushes, you know, trees, those type of things. Um, I don't cut all the onions down. I let some of them go to seed. So the second year they have the onion seeds. I save the onion seeds and I shake the onion seeds back into that bed. And since it takes two years and I've been doing this for a few years now, every year I have a new bunch of onions. Um, so look at perennials for food that you want. Rhubarb is another perennial that comes back year after year. Asparagus comes back year after year. Strawberries. So if you want to grow a little more food, get more perennial plants. Those are our questions for May of 2024. Thanks for joining us. I hope you got something out of this. 
If you have any more questions, just email me at support at foodplusfreedom.com. Remember, grow food, buy local, and be free. We'll see you next week. Bye now. Mm -hmm.